Um, so I want to share uh, some of the lessons we've learned in the digital strategy that we have at NPR. NPR is um, a public broadcaster in the States. We were established in 1970. We have 35 million people who listen to us on the radio, the traditional radio, a week. We have 70 million people a month that come to our website and about 80 million podcasts downloaded each month. Uh, we have uh, bureaus in 17 um, countries across the world. And importantly, we are carried on about 1,000 stations across the United States. The interesting piece to this is each station is independent. They license the content from us. We don't run any individual stations. Furthermore, while the stations pay us for the content, the vast majority of the money that uh, comes to stations comes from them asking people to donate to them. People voluntarily donate to their stations. Uh, so very little money comes from the government. And what this means is we have to make sure we are always maintaining a close relationship with the people so much that they love public radio so much that they will give their own money to support public radio. Um, and radio is what we've been doing for 40 years, but the world, of course, is a lot more complicated. Uh, these are uh, stats from the United States on how many, uh, the percent of the adult population that have listened to, pub or to radio, any type of radio, online in the last week. And the trend, the trend is pretty scary if we were to just focus on traditional broadcast uh, because we see massive consumption. But it doesn't stop being scary there. Of course, uh, this is a terrifying view uh, that is very typical in America, which is people's last screen that they look at in the evening and the first screen that they look at in the morning is their mobile device. It is the thing that they are going to for all if not most, uh, of their media consumption. But um, it is not the only screen that we have to worry about. It is much more complex in the digital landscape. Um, there, of course, is uh, a website uh, that has to be responsive for any screen size. We have to be able to show it, whether it is uh, on a uh, laptop or desktop or tablet or mobile. But then we need to build uh, experiences that are very much directed to the smartphone experience, one that people have with them all the time. They're looking for information, but they very much do use this as a listening device. Uh, tablets, which for us, we see that they will use it as a listening device, but they expect a much more immersive, uh, much better user experience that brings them into that experience. And two emerging platforms that we are very concerned with. Uh, the first is InDash, the in-car. Almost half of public radio listening in the United States happens in the car. And every major man car manufacturer in the United States is now delivering uh, content into the car over internet. Uh, the number of people who are using it right now is small but growing. And of course, if it displaces half of public radio listening, we would be very concerned about that. When we first approached the car manufacturers five years ago, it didn't even occur to them to talk to us. They assumed that simply having some third-party app in the car would be sufficient and that they did not need to have a relationship with National Public Radio. So very pleased that today we have deals in place with all the car manufacturers. And then the fifth, and this one's very much emerging, but for a lot of people, the best set of speakers they now have in their house is the ones that are built into their TV with the uh, built-in internet connection content available, whether it is Apple TV, Google TV, uh, Roku, or um, uh, Google uh, Chromecast. So we need to work to make sure that we are across all of these platforms. Um, but the complications don't end there. The expectations that we see of the audience is very different on digital than in, in broadcast. Netflix is a movie streaming uh, service in the States, and when they put a new season of a show out, they put the entire season out once because they really embrace the idea of on-demand listening. Give people the content when they want it, not when you want to give it to them. 
Uh, Amazon, major shopping site, right? One of the things it does very well is personalization. If you're looking at one thing on the, the shopping list, it starts to recommend other things that might also be appealing to you. And this is a behavior that the audience just has come to expect. Uh, social media and the power of discovery. The ability to share with your friends what you're consuming, what you're loving, what you're engaging with, and to see what they are doing as well. I just went to a movie and I loved it, or I went to a restaurant and it was great, or this news item came up and we should all be talking about it. They expect these services to be built in to any digital experience. And of course, localization, the ability to be contextually aware of where the person is consuming. When I uh, look at my restaurant recommendation app, and I'm here in uh, Paris, I expect it to tell me restaurants here in Paris, not back in Washington, D.C. Um, so it ex the device travels with you, and the experience should reflect that reality. Uh, the scariness doesn't stop there. The type of competitors we have in the digital landscape are much more diverse, and there's new ones every day. There are competitors who have just traditionally been in the content space, um, who maybe they were in uh, just the tech space, but now they're starting to explore other forms, video and audio. And then we have a lot of folks who are just trying to put platforms that are really compelling. And some of these platforms can be great partnerships for us to work in, but sometimes they can be highly competitive where they are trying to establish the relationship with the audience and own uh, that experience. So we have uh, seen, of course, the overall broadcast numbers in America have been on a uh, decline for about a de decade. But um, specifically, just putting the same stream of audio up online and allowing people to listen to it digitally had been growing for us. But over the last year, that has started to decline as well. And this is not a surprise at all if we think about those expectations. Listening to a live stream on your digital device does not personalize to you. Maybe you can get a local stream, that's great, uh, but there's no social interaction and, and you don't have any control of on demand. You're only hearing whatever is playing right then. You're not necessarily hearing the thing that you want to do. So what to do about this? Um, I feel that this is not digital specific. Any audience strategy has three components that can feed into each other. The first, thinking about what you want to do to bring more people to your product. It doesn't matter what your product is, how are you attracting more people to it? So for us, how do we bring more people to public radio? Frequent, so that's reach. Frequency, once they do start coming, what can you do to make them use you more frequently, more often, whether that means more days a week or more times a day? How can you increase the number of times that folks are engaging with your product? And the last one is very important to us in public radio, of course. It is connection. How much are they actually making you a habit? How much do they identify your product as part of their life? You know, for me, you know, uh, Coke Zero, Diet Coke, it's part of my life. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but it is habitual and I uh, consume it all the time. How much have you taken it just from going often to something that is connected? And in our case, uh, getting people to love public radio so much that they will actually donate. And this last one, people with deep connection, feeds into the first one because when we look at millennials, those people who came of age uh, during you know the year 2000, um, and we asked them, those people who have uh, are millennials and are listening to National Public Radio (NPR), where did they discover us? The most common answer was from someone who was deeply connected. It was a professor who brought NPR into the classroom for a lesson plan. It was a roommate or a romantic partner. It was someone they worked with, at, uh, or. Frequently, they borrowed someone's car, and the car was uh, already programmed to it. So the people who are most connected are most likely to introduce new people um, to your product, or in our case, National Public Radio. So that's a general audience strategy, and the primary focus for us, digital is an audience strategy. How do we bring people in, get them using public radio more frequently, and get them more connected? Yes, we do need to do other things. We do need to raise money. Again, our primary source of money, though, is people donating to their station. So if we drive a deep connection, 
that works very well. So what do we do? We see it as there being three areas that you can really invest in solving this problem. Um, the first, digital content. The second, making services that really make your content and your experiences able to uh, go everywhere that you would like them to go. And the third is the actual end user products and platforms. Um, so let's dive into those. First, digital content. You have to make the content that works on these platforms. Uh, Twitter, what we have on broadcast radio obviously doesn't work on Twitter. We need to actually put the tweets out that go there. Uh, we have over, uh, I think almost 5 million, over 4 million uh, uh, Twitter followers. And for connection, this is the place they're having the conversation. If we're not a part of that conversation in that place, uh, we're not getting to that last leg of people who are frequent but actually connecting them more. Facebook. Our number one source of traffic is Facebook. More than Google, more than any other place, we get folks from Facebook. Um, so again, uh, this is about reaching new people, making sure that they're seeing us on the platform that they use without the day, and connecting uh, more closely. And then finally, of course, uh, is our website. Uh, people using these, again, across uh, screen sizes. But uh, the interesting thing about our website is the realization that we, we came to that our best top performing stories, four out of five times, are not stories that we put on radio. They were stories built specifically for digital. Um, and this really makes us realize that our, our core strength is great journalism and good storytelling. We happen to be on radio but we need to start with the story first and then tell the story the way it was meant to tell. Some of them perform better on radio. Some of them are going to be better as text and pictures. So uh, again, uh, a majority of, uh, of the traffic and a majority of the engagement with our website is telling different aspects of the story or completely different stories than what we told on radio. Uh, and, and finally, podcasts. I believe there was discussion about podcasts earlier. This is an absolutely wonderful platform for us. It is, um, there is one other source of revenue we get. Uh, we take advertisements. There's restrictions uh, on them that are uh, very distinct. Um, and when it comes to digital revenue from advertising, podcasts were our most successful uh, venture last year. We produce uh, a number of different types, and they're, of course, much easier to produce and to launch new ones than an entire new radio show. Um, we don't need to coordinate with a bunch of stations uh, to get them to carry it. We are simply able to put it out there. And we can go after very niche topics. Uh, so Hidden Brain is an exploration of, of kind of the biases, the things that move us uh, in our brain uh, that is very science-y, very geeky. Um, and it's something that would be hard to carry as just a part of another radio program to explore it that much, but it makes for a great podcast with uh, great engagement there. So podcasts have been tremendously successful, and what we do with it is we actually, with the advertising, uh, we use uh, a service to dynamically stitch on the advertisements to the, the beginning and the end, so we constantly are able to update the inventory on it uh, and have the value of uh, people coming to them, because many of these are, are not based in time. You're able to enjoy them long after the fact. So we are able to very carefully control that. Uh, and if something becomes popular that we made a year ago, uh, able to monetize it effectively. Uh, services. Um, this one gets really technical, and I could talk uh, for hours about it. But the basic question becomes, how much are you enabling the distribution of your content and your experiences? So we build everything as an application programming interface so that all of our content, all of the data that we know about everything that we have is completely agnostic as to which platform. It doesn't care if we want to put it up on a website or if we want to work with another partner. So we build tools around uh, um, these services 
make sure that they're well documented, it makes it easier for us to work with partners. And what that allows us to do is very, very quickly and at low cost to ourselves, launch, launch partnerships uh, with the car companies, with the Apples, with the Googles of the world. And more than just making it easy and low cost by having really smart, architected, and thought out services for uh, all these systems, it actually enables us to better control the relationship because we're able to influence the type of experience that we put on their platform by showing them that we actually have the technology to deliver it into their platform. And that has uh, been a very critical part of our business development with these partners. And then finally, uh, products and platforms. So the reality is the content is experienced by the user not just as pure audio, but or pure text and pictures, but how those come together with the platform. Our preference, if we could have it, would always be to have people come to products that we did, our website, our mobile apps. That's not always going to be the case, but it will never be the case unless we build really delightful, wonderful experiences that match the quality of the content. So one of the uh, big efforts that we've had in this regard has been um, a application we call NPR One that starts to bring in a lot of these features that we were talking about before. And we've launched it across a number of mobile devices. So let's take there a look. Are people working. This was a little troublesome before. We'll see if it works better now. There are people working at NPR 24 hours a day. So um, what you saw in there is we developed an app that has a lot of those features that we see is so important. So it creates an experience as the user launches the app tailored just for that user. It is localized. It allows them to skip and mark interesting, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But then that starts to be powerful data that we're able to see on how users are engaging with our content. And uh, allows it, of course, to localize, allows the social media to share. So how did we go about this? Well, we started with the clock, which is our programming vehicle for our broadcast shows. Uh, very rigid scheduling of how our show is produced. And when we were looking at it, we realized um, that there actually is an algorithm to our clock. The important thing was not taking an hour-long show, but recognizing that in the course of that hour, we tried to accomplish many different things but there was a certain pattern to how we wanted to do it. We wanted to tell people the most important story, but then we wanted to take them somewhere, have them experience something new. We wanted to introduce them to somebody that they hadn't heard from before. And as we started thinking about it, we then realized what we wanted to do was break apart, decouple each individual story, each individual news item. If we were going to really create a personal experience, start with the stories, 
but then categorize the stories not by the normal topics, so not by like science versus politics, but more of an emotional um, uh, description of how it is impacting the user. Is this story kind of the main t type of lead story of the day? Or is this a story that is more whimsical, adds a little humor, and is supposed to lighten things up? And you could almost think of it as uh, the importance of uh, the order that your meal is served first, right? You don't, you don't serve the soup after dessert. Um, and what we found is while machine learning, uh, what we typically call algorithms, can do a great job of knowing if you like one story over the next, uh, the problem is they typically lead to that example of giving you two stories that don't work well together. And that really is the algorithm that we look for our human editors to curate, the flow. What is the sequence that will keep people engaged the longest? And in fact, when we tested uh, human curation versus just pure machine learning and just constantly giving people what we thought was the story that they would like the most, um, based on machine algorithms, the human curation actually outperformed the machine learning by about five minutes. It took listening from about 25 minutes to 30, 30 minutes. But of course, the combination of the two is where we get the most power. Understanding that of a particular type of story, of our lead stories that we could present you, which one is most appealing to you becomes very powerful, knowing that after that, we may want to follow up with a story that is uh, more, uh, less intellectual perhaps and, and more entertaining for a brief pause. So that takes us to uh, the, the personalization that then for every user, it ends up working differently, um, but has a lot of the same editorial curation that goes into it. Uh, another aspect that we get in this is uh, a lot of data and we can test things and learn how they work. So we were talking about podcasts before and we we're talking about programs. One of the things we can do is test to see how much engagement uh, our audience has. I don't know if this audio will work. Let me try something. I'm Caitlin Dickerson with NPR's Investigations Desk. During World War II, the U.S. military tested chemical weapons on its own troops. Guys were in there screaming and hollering and let me out and just felt like you were on fire. Thousands of American soldiers were exposed to mustard gas, and many have suffered lifelong health consequences. The government promised to take care of these men, but in our reporting, we found that didn't happen. And we found something else, another set of tests that the U.S. military had never acknowledged until now, tests that singled out soldiers based on their race. To hear the investigative report, just tap the button on your screen. So what you heard there at the end was, uh, again, it was a call for action. Tap on your screen if you're interested. We've been able to do this with expanded coverage of areas to see how much more interest there is in a topical bit of coverage. We've also been able to test new podcast ideas where we've said we have this new podcast on cooking and we give a brief description. If you're interested, tap now. And so we're able to inject things because it's a personal experience and we're able to drop them in and know what is most likely to work, uh, we're also able to test and see how that does. And then it becomes all about the data and the things that we have learned. So um, we, again, can get signals from whether people skip out of a story, whether they listen to it completely, or there's even a mark interesting button and whether they tap that. And so we've learned things like uh, a lot of our stories did not have very good intros. People are, uh, typically make a decision to skip or not in the first few seconds. Um, and if it does not have a compelling intro explaining what's happening and the story forthcoming, um, they, they tend to end up exiting out of the app rather than skipping the story and staying engaged with the next thing they want. We've also seen that we've been able to change the listening patterns throughout the day. Typically, we saw just listen and broadcast, we see most of our listening just during the two drive times. Still mostly true, but we're able to lengthen out the amount of uh, day. We've gotten more data uh, to see the type of uh, content people are interested in. In the morning, people like the most powerful breaking type of news. They're less interested, we've seen, in the afternoon, and we have the data to show uh, that they are, are more interested in deep dives, longer coverage, but not just a quick rundown like they are in the morning. 
And we were able to give feedback to our own newsroom. For example, when there was the big Ebola outbreak in Africa, our newsroom felt like we had sort of covered it too much. People must be tired of it. But inside of NPR One, we saw that people were not skipping, that they were still highly engaged with that content. And we were able to tell back to our newsroom, no, there is still a great interest and great demand for that content. So that is, uh, I think, you know, our app that we are most proud of and focused on right now that brings together all of these things. But of course, in digital, you don't get to do one thing. Uh, you have to uh, embrace the audience wherever they are, focus on your strength, but really making sure that you are thinking about how your content and the experience are coming together for the audience. So I want to thank you for your time. And thank you very much. Les cinquième rencontres Radio 2.0. 